Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cock and trice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig because why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an etrometta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one because number nine is Jenny cragging it. Edward the third of of England was so tired of his royal court and nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in times of need. Edward mandated a maximum belt size and also, if you watched part one, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 18. 56. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. In our number 8 spot today we have the Mongol invasion. Being in China during the Mongol invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 12 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 120 million before to just 60 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. Number 7. Roasted Swan This one is supposed to be a delicacy. Roasted Swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed, roasted, and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird, so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off. It's just, it's strange. I feel like that's not very sanitary. I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part. You you always have to remove the feathers, don't you, Chris? I don't know. It's weird. Number six, Lady of the Lake. Have you ever been given that one thing? You know what I'm talking about. That, that one thing that you really, really wanted. For some, maybe it was a bicycle. Others, it could have been a promotion at work. For me and the boys at 3 a.m., it was beans. Anyway, just kidding. That's, that's, that's a joke for the internet. They'll, they'll like that one. Beans. <coughs> oh, cough it. Well, when you were given this thing that you really wanted, did a mysterious woman submerge from the water and rise from its depths and then hand it to you? Probably not, because if that happened, you should be locked up. That's like an insane time level, like hallucination. Anyway, well, that's what the Lady of the Lake did for King Arthur. Except it wasn't a bike or beans. Uh, it was a sword, which in a way it kind of led to his promotion as king, so I guess that counts. Sometimes she's depicted as being a helpful lass, and others she's more of a villain. However, I think Monty Python says it best. <clears throat> Paraphrasing. Strange women lying about in ponds, distributing swords as no basis for a system of government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate of the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. You can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tartar is sold at you. 
What do you say? In our number five spot today, we have the Executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. While there is, of course, now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge, hooded, evil people, history shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people, of course, saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly, people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. Number four, going to the schedule delifing. Entertainment wasn't as accessible or the same as it is now. In modern times, we pull up our phones, turn on our laptops, sit in front of the TV, and there is all the entertainment we need, from battles to baby drama. But back in the Middle Ages, there wasn't much to do after you were done your work for the day. There were forms of entertainment, music, theater, games, sports, etc. But a favorite would have to be going to see the latest ne'er-do-well lose their head. Public shows of punishment were not just something you went to see when you were bored. Actually, their more important purpose was as a deterrent for anyone who thought of maybe committing a crime. And yeah, that would do the trick. It was also a good way to finalize the trial of a criminal for all those who were affected or who were part of the village. Eventually, they became more of a private affair, but not entirely with the last public de-lifing in the United States happening in 1936. Let's not bring this one back. No, I'm good. I'll pass. Shark Week. Aunt Flo. She shows up sometimes during those delightful few days that ladies have. I hear you. I know. I'm not a lady. I don't know why I said that. I'm just trying to relate to the audience. But have you ever wondered how things were dealt with before the modern world of feminine hygiene products? Today, you got options. But back then, well, they didn't really exist. Ladies had to come up with methods and honestly, the beginnings of what the products would eventually evolve into. A lot of times it was extra cloth or rags were used, perhaps where the expression on the rag may have come from. Mm -hmm. Now I have no issue talking about this because it's natural, it's a part of life. I'm a grown up dude. The tradition of this point is in the tradition of hiding it or being ashamed. That's what started in medieval times too, unfortunately. And sadly, it's carried over to today just a little bit. Some even consider cramps to be a punishment for Eve's original sin back then, which is just so stupid. Things have gotten a little better, but I, I think you can all agree with me ladies, it's time for everyone else to grow up a little bit. Number two, clocks. Yeah, if you think a piano falling on your head is insane odds, now imagine a clock. Welcome to the medieval times. The 16th century saw the beginning of clock making, and early on, these things, they were units, they were massive. Great, great grandfather clocks, these early mechanical pieces, they were made of metal and were chock full of machinery. Weight equals danger. And in 1513, a man named John Townsend was holding an iron clock, very proud, when all of a sudden it slipped from his hand and it hit the young man right next to him. William Brett, it hit him right in the forehead, and the next day, Brett died of his injuries. The guy died because he got hit with a clock. What a way to go. Number one, divorce by trial. My personal favorite on this list, divorce by trial or divorce by combat. Either or, same thing. It's exactly what it sounds like. What if divorce court had a little less paper signing and a little more club swinging? Sprinkle in a little bit of Hunger Games and bam, boom, you got yourself a medieval divorce. It was a fight until you had to call Dompe the Gravedigger. The wife had a sling and a stone, the man had a club and was stuck in a hole ways deep just to even the odds. May the better may the better spouse win. Whoever was left alive afterwards got to be live free and then now they were divorced because the other spouse was no longer breathing. Who would've, who would've thought, who would've known? That's crazy. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe and even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds and I'm not sure I would really trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? 
But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. Number nine, the main hall. The idea of a standing army wasn't exactly a thing during the medieval period. So what you would have is your knights or castle soldiers. And unless there was a barracks, the main hall would often convert to have a bunch of cots in it where these soldiers would sleep. It could also be where your guests might stay and even your servants if you didn't have a room for either of them. And then it became your dining room. It was also your party room and your courtroom. It was honestly a pretty versatile room. So much room for activity. You could probably imagine the amount of tomfoolery that happened here though. A large group of sweaty men and women after a feast, and they don't have to walk home because they are staying the night. Nice. Number eight, pestilence. In case you didn't know, you probably do, but sickness was an issue for the folks in medieval times, especially if you're a man who's working in the fields or the markets or the public, trying to bring home whatever form of currency is appropriate for the area. You can't do anything if you're sick in bed, or at least that's what I used to tell my mom when I wasn't totally faking a stomachache because I didn't want to go to school. I totally wasn't faking it. I was sick. But a big bug going around at the time in people's tummies was the bubonic plague. Yeah, classic. The big one. Some statistics suggest staggering numbers of people succumbing to the plague. Millions of people and the plague isn't a pretty one. Skin turning black from necrosis, boils, blisters, ugh, it's a bad look. You don't, you don't want it. At number seven, cock and trice. When living in medieval times, people had to be very creative when it came to cooking. You had to create flavors with limited resources while also trying to dodge the risk of poisoning people if you're not careful. But this next dish pushed the boundaries of culinary art so much that Gordon Ramsay would have to call every chef who made this an idiot sandwich. Back in medieval times, some chefs would prepare a dish called cock and trice, and it was kind of a monstrosity. This imaginative dish was made by combining a pig and a chicken into some kind of revolutionary Frankenstein's monster. Essentially, this dish was made by cooking a pig and a chicken, and then the chef would cut both animals in half and then attach the front half of a pig to the rear half of a chicken. Then it would be stuffed and roasted on a spit, glazed in egg yolks and saffron, and topped with a gold leaf before being served to an elite like a king or queen. There was also an alternative version of this dish where instead of having the two halves of the animal mashed together, it would instead have the chicken riding the pig, and some chefs would even adorn the chicken with a knight's helmet for some extra pizzazz. Not sure why this was invented, but it certainly is creative to say the least. Number six, ins and outs. My favorite title, I've worked here for a year and a half now, it's my favorite title. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the differences. Yes, there's drinking. Yes, it smells like dad breath all throughout the air. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably. Whereas the tavern, not so much housing, more of rough housing, you know what I mean? Taverns were almost a private event thing. Your neighbors would whip up some ale, light a candle, two is a company, three is a crowd, come on in, now we got a basement tavern fight club, let's party. It was that easy, that was a tavern, you now have a tavern. No license, no nothing, just come on in, look what I made, drink it. Number five, steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. So you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. 
when the Catholic number four failure to entertain today if a comedian doesn't make us laugh or we don't enjoy a TV show we just change the channel but back in medieval times failure to entertain the king or queen could result in your death Nicholas Ferriol was one of the most famous jesters in history for instance known as Tribule he entertained King Louis the 12th and Francis the first in France during the 1400s he was born with a smaller head and brain than other children which affected his neurological and physical appearance the king seemed to be amused by this and so he served as his jester he wasn't academically smart but boy was he witty but sometimes is what took him too far this got him eventually into trouble and Francis the first decided to have him executed why he didn't just fire him and kick him out in the first place no idea he must have said something that really towed the line but everything was extreme back then keep in mind but the king asked him how would he like to die and triple a cleverly replied old age this broke the king's foul mood because damn it was a good joke and had him exiled from the realm instead but damn he got it close Right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means of, to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two, number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden, what? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano-Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsund by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Rockskild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extra tropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. Number 10, Hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting Hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spy needles, gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, Iron Maiden. Another medieval legend that might have gone over your head, or rather, in many puncture wounds that is, is the Iron Maiden. No, we're not talking about the band here. The very unique interview aid, if you will. Basically, the Iron Maiden was a steel or iron sarcophagus that was shaped like a lady or a maiden. 
and on the inside was a bunch of pointy spikes that will turn you into ye olde Swiss cheese. While the medieval times were full of unique devices to extract information from heretics, as they were called, uh, this is one invention of more recent centuries and not really medieval times. It's weird because there's already a lot of weird, strange, and brutal machines that would extract information from people in medieval times, so it's kind of weird they came up with this one too. I don't know. It's like a, a fake, but it's also just as, it's very believable, very believable. In our number eight spot today, we have the Groom of the Stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title. It weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods. You know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries, it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facility. This is where the groom of the stool comes in. This high-level nobleman would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. Number 7. Jesters If you were to peer your nightshade eyes into a royal court, it might take a second because that stuff ain't good for it, you'll find a few things. First and foremost, you will see a king and his throne, the man who rules it all. Next to him would be a most beautiful queen, the woman who has it all. Hiding in the room upstairs are his mistresses, that's just how it goes. Loyal knights, advisors, cooks, everyone's here as Mr. Sakurai would say, except for one missing person. Who? Me and, and Adam, the Jesters. Oh, uh, hi. Sorry. The Jesters, the Jokers. Yes, no royal court is the same without the Jester. The Jester's job was to just laugh. He's a ye olde comedian. Now, it might seem like it sucks, especially because, well, they wore strange attire and that hat was supposed to resemble that of an ass's ear or a donkey's ear, depending on what you want to say. But the Jester possesses a unique power. No, not the power to fart on command. That's my power. The power to speak freely, or at least more freely than most. This was a time when speaking out against the king could lose your head. The Jester could speak about the kings this way because, well, everything he said was taken as a joke. Some advice I think we could all take today. Number six, cat burning. Excuse me. Medieval people just hated cats. A lot of the ye old people thought cats were symbols or allies of the big red with the horns. And yeah, they aren't the most pleasant of animals, but I love my cat. Yeah. Not that one. Unfortunately, in the Middle Age France, it was custom to burn a barrel full of live cats over a burning fire every Midsummer's Eve, as people shrieked with laughter and danced around with glee. French kings often witnessed it and even ceremoniously started the fire, but they did much more than that too, like King Charles IX who threw a live fox onto the fire for added variety. Or in 1648, France's King Louis XIV, then aged just 10, lit the tinder on a large bonfire in central Paris, then watched and danced with glee as a basket of stray cats was lowered into the flames. A man who wrote to his brother about the celebration of coronation of Queen Elizabeth I wrote, Last Saturday, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth was solemnized in the city with mighty bonfires and the burning of a most costly pope, carried by four persons in diverse clothing, his belly filled full of live cats, who squalled most hideously as soon as they felt the fire. What the hell? Number five, the bedroom handbook. Like previously said before, when you marry someone, it's for life. You learn to love and you do the bedroom dance with that same person for the rest of your life. For some folks, this was their first time, and as we all know, remember, that can be awkward. <sighs> well, imagine if you had a booklet or an instruction manual on what to do when that time comes, like a Lego manual. Although sometimes even those can be a little confusing. I always have to count the pieces. I get it confused. Well, some churches back in the oldie times were doing such a thing. The Sume Confessorum, as it was known to be called, it detailed exactly on what days were allowed to make the devil's dance possible. By the time all the rules were read and followed, you were boiled down to a small window about once a week, or sometimes none at all. And especially not on Sundays. Ooh, you better not do that on Sunday, man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's the wrong time to do it. Never do it on Sunday. At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with Saint Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. 
A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. Number three, the dungeon. You knew this was gonna be here. Don't pretend to be surprised. Well, guess what? It ain't as common as you might think. And it wasn't always a deep, dank cellar in the bottom of the castle. It actually started off as a prison in the tippy top of the tallest, safest tower. Apparently, keeping people in cells wasn't actually commonplace at first. You'd probably just, you know. But hey, when they did have dungeons, then yeah, they were pretty grim. They were always put in the coldest, darkest, most moist part of the castle. And they were usually just prisons. Number two, the rack. Ever just wake up one morning and give a big old stretch because it's Saturday morning, you got to sleep in, the sun's shining, and your bones feel warm from a little bit of sun that's just creeping through from the window. You take a deep breath of fresh air and walk downstairs to your fridge to prepare a feast for breakfast, fit for a king. To think of a day like that starts with a stretch. Well, medieval men got to stretch too, thanks to the help of a device called the rack. Think of a ratchet strap, except instead of your dad yelling at you to make sure the trailer is strapped down, you're the strap that's being stretched. Yes, the rack was a means of torment. Basically, your ankles were tied down at one end, your wrists were tied down at the other, and a large sweaty man turns a gear, and then you get stretched out like a pair of jeans you haven't worn since high school. No, that's right, I know. No, you can keep trying them on, but they ain't gonna fit. That's okay, keep telling yourself that, that's fine. Mine don't fit either. And finally, at number one, live food. I think that by now we understand that medieval cuisine was as much about theatrics as it was about sustenance. Between singing chickens, fire breathing fish, and cock and trices, a lot was happening in the kitchens back then, but by far the weirdest food trend from the medieval age was their live food shows. Because a lot of people loved a good show, chefs came up with a new idea to wow their dinner guests, where they would serve an animal that looked to be dead and cooked, only for it to get up and run away when got to the table. The most common animal used for these theatrics was of course the chicken. To prepare this unorthodox dish, the chef would take the animal, let's use the chicken as an example, and they would pluck it while it was still alive and glaze it to make it look like it had been cooked. They would then wait until the chicken fell asleep in the kitchen and bring it out on a platter. However, just as the chicken was about to be carved up and served, it would wake up and run down the table creating a chaotic dinner. Another common live food that would be served was frog pie. Chefs would put frogs in a pie, and then when the top of the pie was cut open, the frogs would jump out and startle the dinner guests. Now how's that for dinner and a show? Kicking off the list at number 10, the big city. Okay, it's the 14th century, it's Saturday, you and the boys are off to have a hoot and or holler. You decide to hit the big city, check out one of those medieval taverns that everybody is talking about. So what should you expect? Should you get your fake ID? Should you have a, your passport? Is there a bouncer? What's covered tonight? How many rupees is covered? Well, for starters, this is a long time before Ubers. So unless you have a horse or two, you're gonna have to walk quite a bit just to get to the bar. If the Black Death didn't get you, the commute into the city definitely would. Your knees would be clicking. Living in the city was horrible. Strict curfews were put into place. Violent crimes would happen all throughout the night because obviously back in those days, there's no police force out patrolling. Just shady dudes in hoods. Just Big Ched would be in the corner with his hood up, just planning something, you know what I mean? Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight savings. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as the <laughs> recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like, Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. It gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. 
finish work. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, swans. This is actually a thing, and it has been since the 12th century England. It must be kind of weird just partly being born into the royal family, becoming queen and king, and being told, uh, yes, uh, you own all of England, and you own all the swans. What? Yes, you have to attend the swan upping. What the heck is that? Well, since the 12th century, the English crown has owned all wild, mute swans in open water. Over time, they allowed other select individuals to have some swans. These privileged individuals had to mark their bird to distinguish them from royalty, a tradition which continues today. The queen only exercises the right over wild, unmarked swans near the Thames. The royal swan upping is when all of the swans on the River Thames are counted, checked for their marks, and then released. The royal swan marker is currently David Parker, and apparently it's one of the queen's favorite things to do. That's adorable. In at number seven, in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law, and so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves, fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle ages. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Refusing knighthood comes in at number six. This law was put into place in 1233. Why you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're gonna have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word Renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine if you would, how you would feel after grueling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders and maintaining a family. So that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner. And on top of that, they're sewing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle. Just like a turducken because they're bored and that's, that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom, Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, Monkey King. 
probably the most famous legend out of medieval China. My first knowledge of the story came from Adam, actually. Uh, he was showing me a video game that was in production based upon this legend. It's pretty cool. Anyway, the story goes that his monkey was born of stone and he gained supernatural powers and he was imprisoned by Buddha for 500 years. His mission was to travel west to where the Buddhists were there living their life as Buddhists do and he was going for some sweet, sweet revenge. He possesses super strength and he's a masterful warrior. You can see images of the Monkey King and his likefulness at festivals wherever his strength is needed. In our number two spot today we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring. It's basically like a human hamster wheel but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said you know structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. Number one, ladies. Okay, so let's say you're married. Husband tends the crops. You as the wife take care of the home. This isn't a statement about the patriarchy. I'm just saying taking care of the home is just as important back then. Seriously, it is. Well, your husband comes in from tending the fields one night with a fever. Uh-oh, he's fallen ill, and now he's perished. Now you're left alone with no income and a society that's probably not okay with you working. So that means it's time to pull up your pants. Well, actually, pull them down, as in a scenario like this, it would be time to work that street corner, and a lot of women did do that. The same way Adam works on building Legos in his dungeon. A joke. But as they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, and folks, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Tradition or not. Number 10. Andrew, is, uh, is this you? What? There is no lighter way to put this. We talked about a court jester or a fool, but did you know that some medieval royal courts had professional farters? Yes, that's people whose sole purpose in life was to fart. I'm still trying to figure out how Andrew can fart on command, but these guys did it as a job. These guys would fart their way to being rewarded with houses and lands for their fartscapades. Fartscapades that would include passing their intestinal wind in unique, creative, musical, or amusing ways. <laughs> I wonder, if, I wonder if the mic picked that up. This quote I found from St. Augustine in City of God says, these talented individuals had, quote unquote, such a command of their bowels that they can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. The most famous of the medieval flatulists, no, that's not a joke, that's actually what they're called, was Roland the Farter from Hemingstone Manor in the county of Suffolk, England. In the 12th century, who could shoot water up to five feet? He could squirt water out of his bum. Well farting. Ready? Get some water. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, famine. Back in medieval times, food supplies solely relied on good weather and proper harvests. And obviously lack of rats definitely helps. If the seasons were dry, people of course starved. More often than not, common folk would survive on rations of berries, corn, and wheat. Now the lack of food of course led to disease. Now if they didn't starve to death, illnesses like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid, influenza, and mumps often did the trick. The great famine of the early 14th century was historically awful. Between 1315 and 1322, it rained for 150 days at a time. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. Western Europe was a mess. These conditions took the lives of 15% of England. Farmers couldn't plant or harvest crops, and the winters during these years were historically bad as well. Insane rainfalls and severe freezing. We're still struggling to adapt to weather changes today, but imagine the dark ages. Weather sucked every day, it was horrible. Number eight, adultery. There you were, standing like a wallflower at your town's clubhouse. Ours was called the Lions Club, you know what I'm talking about, small towns. Wearing a little old thing your sister lent you. Cowboy boots clatter as the music gets quieter. Then a hand some young man wearing jeans all over took you by the hand. Oh, romantic. You've been together ever since. I'm sure I, I literally just nailed that for some people. That's pretty much how they're married now. Except now he's not as charming. Now he's got a beer gut and he farts in his sleep. Ugh. Oh well, that's married life. I'm sure the medieval people went through a very similar process. What am I getting at? Well, when you get married, it means you're with that person forever. That includes the bedroom. Well, kings and queens of yieldy times ignored that rule. Besides the obvious political reasons for marrying, which I'll get to later, what was the point of marrying for love if you're just gonna have 30 mistresses or a secret lover? 
I would list the kings and queens who partook in this, but it would simply be easier to list those that didn't partake in that. You know what I mean though? What's the point? What's the whole point of doing it? If you're just gonna, yes, we love you together forever and then, how you doing? It just doesn't make any sense. NP reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. Number six, the buttery. I can't believe it's not butter. Well, believe it, sister. This has nothing to do with butter. No, in fact, the name actually comes from beer butts, otherwise known as barrels. The room itself was located pretty close to the main hall, where yeomen would serve beer to the people who were too low on the ladder to be allowed to have wine. And it was usually connected to the beer cellar down below. How is this unholy? Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never done a single holy thing after a few beers. Number five, assassination. Let's say for a second you ain't such a bad guy. Let's say you're a king that everyone likes. You listen to the people's woes of hunger and pain. You distribute the wealth and your fashion isn't too ridiculous for the time. And I'll get to that later because that's, that's definitely a point. You care, which for the time is rare. Well, that's too bad because a lot of men in history, whether they were loved, hated, or something in between, there's always someone lurking around the corner waiting to pour poison in your ear whilst you sleep. Yes, the art of assassination, or at least as I'm told it uh, from ninja movies and Assassin's Creed. Many have and will succumb to an assassin, whether it was for political, financial, or just crazy reasons. It happens, and for some reason, no one ever expects the hidden blades. Well, I know. I know Ezio, and I would never let my guard down for a second to allow that to happen. All right, we're good, we're fine. Just check it. At number four, singing chicken. Continuing on with another insanely weird food from the medieval age, we have one that was pretty dangerous to eat, though the people who lived back then probably didn't know it was so unsafe. Back then, some chefs would prepare a pretty theatrical dish and called it singing chicken. Man, the things that they did to these poor chickens. Anyways, singing chicken was prepared by taking the chicken's neck and tying it with quicksilver and sulfur, and when the bird was heated, it made a sound like it was singing. Why this was necessary? Who the heck knows? There were other versions of these kinds of theatrical meals as well, where swans, pigs, and even fish were made to look like it was breathing fire. Chefs would soak cotton in alcohol and place it inside the animal, and when it was time to serve, they would light the cotton on fire and make the food look like it was some kind of dragon. Number three, tavern history. Before the Middle Ages, there were still taverns, places where alcohol was sold. Of course, this goes back thousands of years. Taverns, believe it or not, existed during ancient Roman days. In ancient Greece, the Lesh, which was a fancy club, it served food to its members as well as strangers. So it was the first tavern, essentially. Ancient Greek taverns as well. Imagine making ale in flip-flops and like a little toga. I'd be so... I'd be dancing around, it'd be so light and just, nah, it wouldn't actually be horrible. It sounds like a horrible job. The Code of Hammurabi from ancient Babylonia, so around 1750 BCE, even all the way back then, they had the death penalty in place for those who improperly diluted beer. Imagine losing your head because you threw in too many hops. I'm like, ah, uh, oops. You see him take a sip, he's like, mmm. They're like, oh, please. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. That's it. Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310 in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was 
bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Bonifaci VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool, you can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And Number one, animal trials. So it turns out that not only were humans punished if they did something illegal, it was also animals as well. In medieval times, apparently it was a regular thing to put animals on the stand. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, you name it. Absolute craziness. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Flies! They have no control, they don't even know what they're doing. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation. Needless to say, they weren't well liked. So, they were appointed a lawyer and given great dignity in court, though the verdict was obviously not favorable because they couldn't speak for themselves. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil, and to let them go unpunished would give the devil permission to take over human affairs. So they would like literally hang pigs by nooses to punish them. Did the flies actually ever come back? Uh, probably, but at least the humans felt better about it. Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman, who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard for his parents' un married status. In return, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lies. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly through Throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a Mike and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. Number 8, Beavers. Nice beaver! Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh? Naked gun anybody? Huh? No? I love Leslie Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, beavers. It's my national animal and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states who for sure eat this but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough. It's not actually an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently, well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Cough here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kinda how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Seven, Beowulf. An old English tale of Germanic origins, or really a weird movie in 2007. I doubt some of you may remember that movie, but, but I do, I remember. I was just a kid then, and I was very confused as to what I was seeing. The CG unfortunately has not aged very well. However bad that movie may be, it's based upon an old medieval legend. Beowulf comes to aid the king of the Danes in Hothgar, as the evil Grendel has besieged the fair people. He's a bad dude, you gotta stop him, bad guy. After slaying the beast, the mother of Grendel comes for a piece of the action. Naturally, it makes sense. You know, get rid of the son, the mom comes. It makes perfect sense. Beowulf, in true Hollywood fashion, eventually gets her too, which, can you blame him? I mean, you have to get her too. And eventually, he becomes king. Now, what's the lesson in this one? Uh, always defend your beer hall from evil beasts? Who dare disturb Miller time? Yeah, sure, I don't want my Miller time disturbed. Or maybe that a 2007 CG movie, there was a lot of uncomfortable 
nudity. There was. It was really weird. But it wasn't like, it was like a lot of skin. A little weird skin and like shiny texture. It was strange, trust me. In our number six spot today, we have a sin eater. Okay, this is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this, they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread, they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically, sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. You know, both bad. Number five, helmeted chicken. Why the clock back 10 years ago? I was but a humble freshman in high school. I was green behind the ears. I didn't know what to expect. Sure, people had prepped me for the worst, but I just didn't know what to expect. I got even more nervous when I saw the pretty girls showing up. Gosh, they were so pretty. <sighs> Someone be my girlfriend? But I relaxed. I knew I was okay because at lunchtime, I was gonna watch my favorite YouTube channel, Epic Meal Time. Besides this one, it's a good channel, you should check it out. We're awesome. They made combinations of food that I didn't even think were possible. I was absorbed into their culture, and who wasn't? Why do I bring the awkward time of 2012 back up? Well, that's because the medieval times had their own version of a turducken. Sort of. While it's not a chicken inside a duck inside a turkey inside a pig covered in bacon like EMT did, it's similar and perhaps off-putting for our veggie fans. Basically, there was a chicken sewn to a pig to look like a knight riding on a horse. And yes, I'm sure the chef washed his hands. Right? Number four. Fair. Punishments for crime in the Middle Ages were different from they are today. Capital punishment happens now still, like it did then, but we don't really put people into exile so much anymore. Unless you count the prison system, but th that's another conversation altogether. Back in medieval Ireland, though, someone who de-lifed someone else and was judged to be guilty was given to the deceased's family as their unwilling servant. That is, if they failed to pay the oodles of money required to buy their freedom. As we know, people who were forced into manual labor were not treated too nicely. And they were pretty much had no rights at all, being seen as property more than an individual. This means that the family that now owns said person could do whatever they wanted with them. Their life was basically forfeit. Now, if the person who ended the life of one of your beloved family members was now given to you to do whatever you wanted with them, what would you do? Yes, yes, me too, mm -hmm. probably. It seems fair to me. Leave the punishment to those who are most affected by the crime. Number three, outhouse troubles. This next one really stinks, my gosh. If you're eating food right now watching this, maybe skip to number two. I won't take it personally, here we go. On June 2nd, 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan went out to his back garden to use the medieval outhouse, AKA the cesspit. Now today they're built a little differently, but back in the day it was a massive hole with a wooden rim. It wasn't pretty, it didn't smell great, it was horrible, it was made you sick. Now Duncan, the poor lad, rumor has it, he was a little intoxicated and Duncan, while doing his business fell into said cesspit, leading him to suffocate to death in the worst way imaginable. Now it sounds like a crazy way to go in medieval times, but it can happen today as well. Because in 2014, two people lost their lives trying to recover a cell phone that fell into a porta potty. Yeah, imagine that. Losing consciousness and feces is a dangerous place to do it. That's very horrible. That's a horrible way to go out. That's the worst way to go, I think. That's the worst. One. Number two, witnesses. I've talked about it before, but it still doesn't make it any better or easier. Every person you see walking around today was created by a couple things. Two people, a Barry White record, and a little bit of friction. Unless you're a test tube baby. Sometimes, like you're a clone in Kamino, you know what I mean? And Star Wars, you know, the, the big tube thing? Anyway, that's life. However, a lot of these moments are private, and they probably should be private. Unless you're an exhibitionist or something. That's how you do things. Well, a lot of times for a marriage to become official, established members from your village or community would come and watch you consummate the marriage. Yes, that's right. Mom, dad, the bishop, heck, maybe even the grave digger down the road because he's got an important job. My question is, what do you say when that's happening? Do you cheer? Do you laugh? Do you... Way to go, kid. You, yeah, that's, that, that's my boy. I don't, what do you do? It's so gross and, ah. Close the door, Dad. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? Just got a hook for a hand. Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A sixth century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah. This man had a knife. 
instead of a hand. This warrior had his hand amputated, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could and that was a knife as a placeholder, or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Number 10. The kitchen. Now that you've got your appetite, let's talk about the kitchen. Major kitchens of the castle usually had to deal with providing at least two meals for several hundred people every day. As you can imagine, this is where the work would be put in. By a large staff too, usually in the hundreds. So you're sweaty from working and surrounded by a bunch of other blokes. Sounds pretty awful. But you didn't take into account the amount of heat. The guidelines on how to make enough food for a two day banquet include the chief cook having to at least have 1,000 cartloads of good dry firewood and a large barn full of coal to keep the fires going. It's spicy in the kitchen, let me tell you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness, because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, garbage. Ever heard of a garbage plate? It's a dish that originated in Rochester, New York, and it is a big plate of things like macaroni salad, baked beans, french fries, and a bunch of other things. Well, in medieval times, they also sort of had their own garbage plate, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound nearly as good as the one from Rochester. Their garbage was pretty foul, and honestly, I don't think that you could pay me enough to sit down and eat this thing. As the name dictates, garbage was made of, well, garbage. Anything that wasn't used in other dishes was basically thrown into a pot, cooked up with some seasonings, hopes, and dreams. Even the recipe sounds gross, dude. In an excerpt from a medieval cookbook, to prepare garbage, it says to quote, take good giblets, aka the garbage, chicken heads, feet, livers, gizzards, and wash them all clean. Throw them into a nice pot and add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, and sage chopped small. Then take bread, steep it in the same broth, draw it through a strainer, add and let it boil till done. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which was sour grape or apple juice, salt, and a little saffron, and serve it forth." End quote. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass on that one, thank you. Number seven, BYOF. If you're passing by one of these middle-aged taverns, maybe you feel like grabbing some questionable lunch. Well, you better come prepared, my friend. Bring your own fork, because we don't have any. We can't afford that. We're not blacksmith, we can't make a fork. What's a fork? We didn't have a moody server sitting in booth 11 doing roll-ups all night. This was the Middle Ages. If you had a fork, you took care of that fork. Forks don't grow on trees, pal. If you were lucky, these establishments would dish out a couple of spoons. Maybe a couple of spoons, but forks? Nice joke, you're getting laughed at. You're watching everybody eat while you start. Historians compared sharing forks to sharing toothbrushes, so that's, in case you're wondering, no, you're not borrowing a friend's. Oh, after you've done that bike, can I just maybe, no, get out of here, see ya, off with your head. You also didn't have a steak knife handy ever. Knives were only reserved for carvers. Until the 17th century, all you had were little daggers. You would just poke and tear through your meal. You just poke it. Number six, disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturbed the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe you had an argument and got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old ha <laughs> ha, one, two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. 
You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, witchcraft. All the way back in 1542, the UK Parliament passed the Witchcraft Act, which condemned anyone who practiced the art to death. It was repealed five years later, then reinstated with flair in 1562, meaning they added more oomph to it. This led to many women being sentenced to gruesome interrogations, trials, and death punishments such as burning at the stake. How does one know that someone was a witch? Well, point one, they look like one to you. Two, if you threw a hog-tied woman into a pond and she floated, she was a witch. Number three, you're a woman and financially independent. Number four, you're old. Honestly, the list goes on. Anyone could be accused of being a witch. If someone wanted an easy way to get rid of you, they could just whisper in someone's ear that you bewitched them when they were dreaming. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. Number three is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions. And fashionable repairs became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restriction six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflect both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for special status items, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 
60,000 of his men, all wearing Persian silk, along with 12,000 slaves who each carried four pounds of gold bars. And he also brought heralds who had golden staffs, along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo, to the royals, to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. And coming in the number one spot today, we have Lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. No. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required waiting in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. Number Number 9. Belladonna, or commonly known as Deadly Nightshade. Now what would our medieval ancestors be doing with such a lethal ingredient? Well, truth be told, it had a few uses. One of the more strange was for beauty. Belladonna had this strange effect on the pupils. The consumption of belladonna through eye drops or a liquid would result in dilated pupils, which for a long time in Europe was considered to be very beautiful. At least, it was considered beautiful. I don't know if that really is. The trouble, well, it's poison. It's like if you were complimenting me on my summer ready body, except I told you my secret was drinking Drano. Mm. To my surprise, however, this is an ingredient you can find today in certain medicines, combined with other ingredients. In small doses, it makes it not harmful. I thought it would be fun to talk about all the side effects as fast as I can. Dry mouth, dry skin, inability to sweat, muscle spasms, blurred vision, enlarged pupils, hallucinations, inability to urinate, talk to Adam, convulsions, seizures, coma, acid reflux, fever, rapid heartbeat, gastrointestinal infection, high blood pressure, constipation, and more urination problems. Adam's the guy you need to talk to for that. Number eight. Keys to the city. You know when people say that someone got the keys to the city as a way of saying that person can do whatever they want? Well, that came from the medieval times. You see, back in ye olden times, if you lived in a walled city when nighttime hit, they locked those gates up tight. Don't want some slimy bandits, enemy soldiers, or unwanted flatulists coming and going in the city in the dead of the night. Someone who was particularly well liked or who had done something noteworthy to gain the respect, trust, and admiration of the people would be given a key to the city, giving them the free reign to come and go as they please. We actually still do this, but obviously most cities don't really have walls anymore, so it's more of a symbolic thing like, hey, you're great, have this little key that opens literally nothing. You're welcome. Number seven, Jesus take the wheel. With witches to blame for hailstorms, who do we turn to to fight the powers of evil, right? How do we get some goddamn crops back in the game? From the 14th to the 16th century, the ice pack grew around the world. Weather was changing in a drastic way, and by 1550, there had been an expansion of glaciers worldwide. Everyone thought that it was witches causing it. It's like, no, just plain old science. Back then, the general public didn't know what was happening. They didn't have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the phenomenon on a podcast. So people in the medieval times would perform 
rituals for harvesting crops in hopes that something would change. There would be special prayers, charms, beautiful services, all to ensure proper weather and fertility of the fields. Certain saints, like historical saints, they were believed to protect against harsh conditions. To protect us from the frost, we had Saint Surveys, and to shield us from the winds, we had Saint Clement. And to fight back against drought and the rains, we had the one and only Saint Elia or Elijah. The power of the saints and the Virgin Mary were believed to protect against storms and lightning. So that's like the medieval version of the Avengers, I guess. Tis the season. Thank you, Saint Mary. Let's keep it dry. Canada has a huge storm coming tonight, so could use some of that saint power ASAP. Number six, no Irish grandma. In society, we've decided that there are rules and laws and just rules that really just need to be followed in order to have an effective society. Like no harming others or laws that help keep us safe. However, there's some laws that just don't need to be said. Some rules are self-explanatory, like no diving in shallow water. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to hurt yourself. No pooping in public. Of course not. I would never. I promise. And you can't marry your nan. That's right, you can't marry your nan. Yes, that's right. A law from medieval Ireland hits us with a marriage law stating that no man shall marry the wife of his granddad. You see, that's one you didn't have to tell us. We knew that. I knew that. Everybody knew that. Marriage laws were changing at the time because of English rule and a lot of other laws were changing too, but the close family nature of their marriages, well, things got a little confusing. It was just about the time. I'm not allowed to say in I don't think, but it was in that's what it was. So they, they were changing laws, but it was kind of gross. Ugh. Now I feel gross talking about it. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up in your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? Number four, gatehouses. Now for a place with the least amount of holes. Actually, it, it probably had the most. The gatehouse was probably the most fortified structure in the castle. The holes we have here were for the sole purpose of hurling or shooting projectiles. Some were for traps and obstacles. The gatehouse was a house for the main weak spot of the castle, the front gate. And as such, it had to be the most defendable part of said castle. It was also usually the most lavish and ornate part of the castle. If you're inviting Lord Reginald from across the way to your castle, you want him walking through that front door thinking, hey, this guy could absolutely defend against me, but also he has impeccable taste. Number three, men's fashion. I know it was a long time ago, but what the heck happened? Calves were in, like big, they like big calves for some reason, I don't know why. I got big calves, you know what I'm saying? And so were Wario shoes, because Wario. As much as I love Wario, since I basically am him, I mean, that doesn't mean I want to look like and feel like him. Longer the shoes, the higher the social status. Weird, right? I know. This was also the era of tunics, and if there's anything I've learned from watching Hollywood movies, and I've learned a lot, it's that you don't trust a guy in a tunic. So, if everyone around you is wearing a tunic, who the heck can you trust? Sheesh, no wonder kings were so paranoid. Except for Link, he's cool. We, we, we can trust him. We like Link from Zelda, he's, pre he's pretty sick. As for poor men and serfs, you wore basically whatever you could make or afford, which isn't much. There's no long shoes in the potato fields. I'll stick to my plaid. Lots of plaid. I can't help it, I'm Canadian. Hot number two, lamprey. Imagine this, a gross, slithery eel with gray scaly skin and a suction cup-like face full of tiny, sharp teeth. Does that sound tasty to you? Because I can't say it does. However, to people in the medieval age, apparently it was finger licking good because this lamprey was all the rage and was actually a favorite of King Henry I of England who was actually said to have died from eating too many lamprey. Lamprey was considered a delicacy and was often enjoyed with a side of hot sauce. I don't care how it's prepared, you cannot catch me eating a sharp tooth worm of the sea. And finally, number one, the ride home. Like I just said, this was a lot time. People